Driving in tonight, I looked up and I saw a full moon and I was thinking, all the crazies come out, don't they? So this is no exception. <laughs> um, you, you, you know tonight I'm going to talk about the heart. And, uh, and I sort of pined over this the last few weeks because uh, when I got asked to do this, I, I said about three weeks ago, I want to do some, you know, preach something about the heart. And then the precious sister got sick and, and then I thought, no, I can't preach about the heart because I didn't want to upset anybody, <laughs> you know, because it's probably not a good subject seeing my sister's been sick, with, you know, with a heart. But um, I, I, I thought about it and then last night I finally thought, no, I'm just, we're just going to go through with it. So I, I put my message together. And then we all know that um, um, when we're in hospital and we do have to see a cardiologist, the sister would know, uh, they do tests, you know, they do blood tests and they do just... ECG test, but one of the things they do is they take one of these things called a stethoscope, okay? And what they do is a good cardiologist with a lot of experience and a, and a good nurse and a good ambulance officer, for, probably for that matter, can have a listen to your heart. And he can tell whether you've got a healthy heart or a not heart just by listening. Of course, the way it goes, kaboom, 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 and there's all different little ba-booms, ba-booms, ba-booms in there. So, I just... Um, from this morning, see, we have an image in our heart of that ox up there, don't we? And we're going to remember that ox and the traits of that ox. So it's really good to have something visual and something to remember. So what we've all got this little thing here for is we can put this in our ears and just while I'm starting, we're going to pass this around and we're going to, all of us are going to put this on the left side here and be careful because once that's, that's really noisy, it'll... Put it underneath a layer of clothing or whatever you like and we're going to hold it on our left side and we're going to press it really hard. Can't hear a word you're saying, sister. And we're going to give ourselves a little heart check. Okay, so this is just a visual thing that we're all going to do and we're all going to listen to our own heart, our own physical heart. But when we finish, we're just going to tear this off like this. We're going to pull out this little swab. And what we do is, with these earpieces, we just give them a little wipe. Because some of us probably aren't as hygienic as others here. <laughs> now remember, your ear canals go forward. So when we put this in, these have got to see that they go forward, they go forward. So just pass it around while I'm preaching and have a little listen to your own heart on the left side, okay? Close your eyes. Don't worry about what I'm saying because it's not that important. <laughs> A lot of waffle at first. We'll get to the crux of it at the end. And press it against yourself and have a little listen to your own heart, okay? And when you finish, wipe it. Ready for the next person. Okay, the cat's away and the mice will play. So we're just going to have a little bit of fun, okay? But it's very serious. Have a little listen to your own heart. Because it's something you're going to remember. When you, if you ever think back and never try and get this message out of your mind, which you'll probably want to do, um, it's going to come back at you because you're going to go, oh, remember that night we all listened to our heart? That was really silly, wasn't it? <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's certainly an honour to preach the word of God in the house of God to the people of God and I don't take that lightly. Um, it's really an honour to come up here and it's a serious thing. And um, um, we do need to understand our hearts. We, not just referring to our physical hearts but we need to understand that part of us which is called the heart, which we're going to find out about. And it's been a bit of a mystery to me, really, because I've asked a few people, you know, about, oh, so that's your physical heart and that's your spiritual heart and all that, and I've got all different answers. So it's been really interesting to have a bit of a study of that. Can we open up our Bibles, please, to Matthew 5 and 8? And I don't want to sound like I'm shouting at this, but if this rain's going to come down, I'm going to beat this rain. Because I've got a bigger voice than this rain, so trust me. I don't believe this rain's going to ruin anything tonight. So we all know what Matthew 5 and 8 says, don't we? We don't even need to look it up, do we? What does it say? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And when you do that... Uh, thank you. When you do that um, little search, you know, we have them search engines on our computers and things... Uh, the word heart comes up 833 times. The word hearts come up 113 times. 
when you think about the word heart and how many times this week when I was listening to different people talk, how many times, like Brother Tim used the word heart probably about 10 times this morning, probably without even really knowing it. Certainly he might have known that he used it a few times, but all week, everyone has all, every time, you know, it's like when you buy a car and you see it's a little red thing and that's all you see. Well, all this week, all I've heard is the word heart. Christians, non-Christians, everyone going, oh, oh, I felt it in my heart. Or what, what was you thinking in your heart? And, and just the word heart just kept jumping out at me. But it is an amazing word. It does come up in the Bible a lot. But it's very clear in the Bible, if we all want to see God, we must have a pure heart. Okay? So we need to get our heads and minds and brains around this thing called the heart. A baby is born with a pure heart. Do we all agree? A baby is born with a pure heart? Because when a baby's first born, you can just imagine that, that little heart of the baby. We know the heart's the size of the fist, don't we? Well, a little newborn baby, it's about the size of a ping pong ball, or even smaller. Imagine this little thing, you know, size of a ping pong, boom, 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 boom. It's amazing, isn't it? It's got a pure heart because there's nothing impure in it. It's never had a Big Mac. It's never had a chocolate. It's never had a biscuit. It's never had a teaspoon of sugar. So it's got the most pure little heart going, hasn't it? Ah, so I'm trying to trick you now, aren't I? Because I'm talking about the baby's physical heart, aren't I? <laughs> and we also know they're born with a pure heart. There's going to be a lot of confusion tonight because I'm really confused myself. So. <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no cholesterol, bad fat, Big Macs, chips and lollies are the things I've, I've got here in front of me when that baby's first born, is it? So it does have a pure heart in both senses of the word. Um, so what is the physical heart? That's that muscular organ which um, pumps the blood around your body, doesn't it? Till death. Till death. It'll just keep pumping, won't it? And we know it's the size of your fist. Now, a little newborn baby, we know the, the heart pumps at a rate of 150 a minute and we know that a more senior person here, such as the people over 50... Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> Their heart slows down. Quite often it only pump, pumps at about 40 or 50. We all know that even now my heart's now probably pumping at about 95 an hour. Uh, when I sleep tonight, it's probably going to go at about 50 beats a minute because being an athlete, um, that's what happens. So, but the average is about 70. And Brother Tim enlightened me this week saying that women's hearts beats a little bit slower. Was it slower than men? A little bit faster than men on average. So it, it, it's really quite an interesting thing. So if you do the maths on it, which I'll keep at nice round figures, um, at 70 times a, a minute over your life. So when you're a baby, it's 140, 150, 130. But when you get older, it goes right back to 40, 50, 60, and you know, it goes much slower. So it, that, if you multiply it by an hour, is 4,200 beats on average per hour. Okay? Which is, multiply that, is about 100,000 times a day. Your heart beats. A little bit over 100,000 times a day. It's an amazing little machine, isn't it? it um, multiply that by 365 days of the year, and we've got a figure of over 36 million times a year. It beats. <laughs> and if you multiply that by 70 years, which a lot of us get to, and some of them, a lot, it goes up to over 2.5 billion. For those here who are going to live to 80 or 90, or, or a bit more or a bit less or whatever, Two and a half billion times a year uh, uh, in your average lifespan. It's just amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing little machine. No man has ever, no computer even is able to work out anything um, that's able to uh, beat like that. But there's nothing sure that everyone here, providing the Lord tarries, is going to die of a cardiac arrest, speaking of the heart. doesn't matter if we jump from a building or if we were to drink a cup of acid or we were going to get a blood clot um, you know, we're all going to die of a cardiac arrest. Even somebody who got, got their head chopped off dies of a cardiac arrest. You, you, you know, you're not dead unless your heart goes into what we call cardiac arrest, which just stops. So just, just um, trying, to, trying to get my head around the heart, I thought I'd look up what the meaning of the word heart is. And I don't think there's any other word that has more meanings. Just while I'm talking here, think about one of your favourite sayings using the word heart. And I'm going to give you a, a couple that I come up with. Um, you know, why do we say someone has a selfish heart? Does that mean their, their heart is selfish? No, obviously not. Or 
I know people always say about me, I'm a big-hearted fella. No, not really. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, all these sayings, you know, you know, what is your heart telling you? Um, cold hands, warm heart. That's one we've all heard, isn't it? A little distance. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's what I said to Sarah today. Her husband's away working. I said maybe a few distance might make the heart grow fonder. Uh, uh, fonder. Accept Jesus into your heart. We say that as Christians, don't we? What about when you're a little um, child and some other person tells you a secret and then you say, look, you can't tell anyone. Oh, I promise I won't tell I cross your heart and hope to die. You know, it's been grained into us, isn't it? This, this heart thing, you know? Um, if you really want to sound sincere to someone, you say, oh, this is, this is from the bottom of my heart, this, this cup of tea I've just made you, you know? And, and another uh, thing we often say is, um, I've learnt it off by heart. I know my timetable's off by heart. Does anyone else have a heart saying, a favourite heart saying? You've broken my heart. Ah, yes. Love you from my heart. Yep. Your heart is hardened. (laughs) Sorry, did you say? (laughs) Yes. That's... There's so many of them. I, I, have a, I have a lot here, but there's still more. That one's one I don't have here, and that one I don't have here. What about someone who has a change of heart? Is that a heart transplant? No? Okay, so my favourite is, anyone want to guess? Tell them, Kath. <laughs> the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So, I guess it is true, we, we do have a selfish heart. We all here have a selfish heart and we have a generous heart. Because the right side of our heart is very selfish. It sucks all the blood in. And the left side is really generous. It beats on that side because it gives it all away again. So it sucks it all in, goes round through the bottom of your lungs, goes back in the left side of the heart, and that just comes in. Yep, gives it all away and goes through the body, doesn't it? So we've all got a selfish heart and we've all got a generous heart. Physically, <laughs> more of that confusion, eh? Um, but it's a funny thing, the heart, you know, it does, it does um, um, speed up or slow down. You get scared and nervous because the brain tells it what to do. Your heart, physical heart doesn't tell your brain what to do. Your brain tells your heart what to do. So when you get scared, you know, everyone's heard of the fight or flight syndrome, haven't they? You know, you, if someone comes at, you know, comes at you with a clenched fist saying, I don't like you very much, like some people in my job, like, see, see when I come at Chris and I go like that, <laughs> he knows something's going to happen. So then he goes into fight or flight syndrome, <laughs> right? He, he, he's, his heart pumps faster because he's either going to have to fight to defend himself or he's going to run for his life, isn't he? So um, it's an amazing thing that all... Um, you know, if, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're young and your mind's on these things and, uh, and, you know, someone who you really like comes into the room, you know, your heart goes boom, 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 boom. We all probably had that when we were a teenager, didn't we? Um, but it's a funny thing. Our, we say this comes from our brain, but um, what happens if someone's brain dead? How, how does it, you know, how, how, how does all this work? Uh, you know, we, we all require a mind which is a part of the brain, okay? And I sort of liken it to a computer that um, has got no software. The computer's dead. It needs a software. It needs a running system, and that's the mind. The mind, doesn't it? It runs the brain. So we're just trying to get our head, head around our, our brains and our mind and all that sort of thing to start off tonight because it's, it's a bit confusing and it's a little bit funny, isn't it? We've all got a different opinion on how it all works. So, you know, we use that saying before, why do we learn things off by heart instead of off by head? You know, I've learnt my times tables off by head. If I said that, you'd think, that's really weird, because we're all used to saying it's off by heart, aren't we? But did we really learn it in our heart? We didn't, did we? We learned, learned it in our brain, didn't we? We learned it in our mind. And one thing I did research and found, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But everything you, you read on Google is true, isn't it? Um, there was, it said, I found out that there was a mistaken analysis of anatomical functions made by the ancient Greeks. 
right? They placed a seed of thought. So your seed of thought, which is, you know, your, your emotions and all that, they actually thought that it come from your physical heart. So that's why that, the terminology always come out, you know, um, I've, I've had a, an, you know, I've got this really uh, good idea in my heart. Because they actually believe that your thoughts come from your heart and then got processed through your brain. That, that's what I read on the internet, so it must be true. And that, that's, that's how we've come around to this saying that's all ingrained into us that, you know, everything's, you know, oh, you know, he's, he's got a kind heart or a sad heart or whatever. Um, but no thoughts actually come from your physical heart. Despite, at conception, um, the first two cells that are formed in con at conception are your brain and your heart, and they're actually joined together in cells. Then as these cells multiply, they grow apart. Okay? It's amazing. So they grow apart. That's why when sometimes you have something going wrong with your heart, okay, you don't get the pain in your heart, you get the pain up here in your shoulder, up in your jaw. That's because the, the, nerves, the nerves were together and they separated as you grew into an adult. You know, as you, as, you, as you grew in the womb and you got bigger, they separated, but they're still really strong paths. So that's why you have that deferred pain going into your jaw, your neck, your shoulder tip, down, starting to go down your left arm there. So that's, it come from when we were formed as cells, brain and heart, then all the other things started to grow around, didn't it? So I guess that uh, that sort of thing that, you know, our heart is joined to our brain is, was, in ancient times, it come about that way. Of course, they knew that, you know, obviously at formation there had to be a heart and a brain there and then they separated and grew arms and legs and all other strange stuff. So um, can we turn to Matthew 22 and 37, please? But we don't really need to because we all know this scripture, don't we? No? Yes? Some, maybe. Matthew 22 and 37 says that Jesus said unto him, a famous scripture, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So I had to try and work out what all this meant. Because there's the three separate things there, isn't it? Soul, mind, heart. Strong simply says the heart is the thoughts and feelings. It's the mind and it's the middle. Okay, that's what Strong says about the word heart. It says about soul, your breath, your spirit, your mind. See, there's a, there's a link between all three, and they all basically mean the same thing. Your mind is your deep thought, your imagination, your understanding. So they, 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 all, they all cross over there, so it's, it's quite an interesting crossover. So I then went to look for a definition of the heart, and I, and I found a few interesting things. One thing I found was, which I liked, was the vital centre and source of one's being, emotions and sensibilities. It's the repository of one's deepest and sincerest feelings and belief. So when we refer to something comes from our heart, it's, it's our sincere beliefs and feelings and our emotions, isn't it? And so then there's um, various, um, like I said earlier, that it means so many things. And there's so many meanings to the word heart. We know there's other words that, you know, you can take another word and say, oh, well, that has three meanings or two meanings, but I, I don't think you could find another word that has more uh, meanings. And I'm just going to go through a few of them. Um, you, you can have an appeal from the heart. You can have a subject to steer to your heart. Um, the seed of intellect or imagination, or imagination e.g., the worst atrocity the human heart could devise. Uh, emotional constitution, basic disposition or character. For example, a man after my own heart. Uh, the prevailing mood. Um, I wanted tonight's message to be light-hearted. So, so many different meanings, isn't there? You could just, and there's more, more than what I got here. I'm just naming a, naming a few of them. Uh, it's in relation to a person's capacity or sympathy or generosity, their compassion. So, for example, um, you could say that, I won't mention any names, but our leader who seems to have no heart. I mean... Down in Canberra, down in Canberra. Not. <laughs> I was talking about Canberra, talking about some politicians who seem to have no heart, want to tax us, you know. Um, it it re refers to love and affection. I think I better move on. E.g., the soldiers lost heart and retreated. Um, 
the firmness or will or callousness required to carry out an unpleasant task or responsibility. So, for example, I didn't have the heart to send them away without food. So there's just so many meanings of the heart, isn't there? The firmness or will or... Um, just done that one. A person esteemed or admired, lovable, loyal, courageous. You say, they're a dear heart. It's the central or innermost physical part of a place or region. For instance, we're here to t- saying it's the heart of the financial district, isn't it? It's just amazing. It means central as well. That's one of the main meanings of it. You, s- you could say the core of a plant, fruit or vegetable, for example, the heart of the lettuce is rotten. Again, the centre. Some of you are probably thinking in your mind now, um, saying, Brother Mark, stop waffling and get to the heart of the matter here tonight. <laughs> but but um, that's just another meaning of the word. But I'm not, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> it, the heart, another meaning of it, it's the most important or essential part. So, you know, when you've got some big machinery, but there's one little thing that runs that machinery, you go, that is the heart of this machine. Okay? It's... The heart is one's deepest feelings, um, fundamentally. Uh, to do one's heart good. Um, it was really good uh, the other night when we were able to get a phone call uh, for dear sister Eileen to talk to Brother Gill in Africa directly and, and that made her heart feel better. And, I, and not only did it probably make her spiritual heart feel better because she was able to talk to her husband and reassure him and he felt reassured, but it probably made her physical heart better. Because there is a definite link there, isn't there? There is a definite link there when you feel good in your spiritual heart. It's going to make your physical heart feel better. We know people more relaxed, have a slower heartbeat. When someone's more excited or upset, their heartbeat goes up. I go to people who have car accidents all the time. There's nothing wrong with them physically. But their heartbeat's always over 100. It's amazing. They're always 110, 115, 120. Because they're anxious about what just happened. Physically, nothing. But their heart's going, chuk, 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 chuk. their brain said, pump up, you're upset. Um, what about to have one's heart in one's mouth? Which happens to some people just before they get up and preach. <laughs> um, it's to be extremely frightened or anxious. Um, from the depths of your heart is appreciation, sincerity. To have one's heart in the right place is to be well-intentioned isn't it? When, when we use the saying heart and soul, it's completely and entirely, which is what that previous scripture means, you know, your whole entire being, just to worship God. Um, that's your heart, soul, mind, everything. Um, to lose one's heart is when I got married, I fell in love, I lost my heart. Or near or close to one's heart is loved by or important to one. So something's near to your heart. That means that you really you really love that, don't you? To steal a heart is to win one's affection, to take heart, um, to take seriously or be affected or troubled by. Um, so you don't take too much criticism to heart, do you? Um, for one's heart content, one's entire satisfaction without limitation, to wear one's heart on one's sleeve. That's an old saying that I don't use, but I know I've heard it used many times. And that's, for example, to show one's feeling clearly, openly, um, by one's behaviour. So, um, with all one's heart, great willingness, pleasure, with the deepest feeling of devotion. And sometimes if we attempt something, then we don't really give it our all. We're a little bit half-hearted, aren't we? It just goes on, doesn't it? (laughs) I never knew the word heart could come up with so many different, you know, meanings. Have we all listened to our physical heart now? We pass it around. Most of us all had to listen, those who wanted to. Okay, so what I wanted to think about now, we've all had to listen to our um, physical heart. I, I want to talk about um, the comparison between the spiritual heart and the um, physical heart, okay? Okay. So a good physical heart, we know it needs um, food, water, exercise, and and we need to keep our stress levels down. And that's good for our physical heart, isn't it? So to really uh, compare that to the the spiritual would be that the food side of it would be, could we go to John 6, please? 
and 48. So we know, we, we all know, you know, what, what we need to keep our physical heart healthy. We know about the healthy food, you know, drink plenty of water, exercise, keep your stress down. Um, so it's amazing uh, what effect stress has the body on the body, isn't it? A different way it manifests itself in illnesses. Okay, so John 6 and verse 48. I am, I am that bread of life. This is Christ talking. These are words in red. It should be in your Bible. Um, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So um, to have that healthy spiritual food is obviously to feed on the word of God. And we know we need to have that every day to stay healthy, don't we? Um, we know we need to study the Word of God, to come each week and hear the preaching, have fellowship you know, with one another around God's Word. That's what's going to um, give us the food we need to keep our spiritual heart healthy. And we know if we do all these things, it'll keep our hearts pure. Okay, the other thing we need is the water, isn't it? Plenty of water, good, keeps the blood good, doesn't it? We know that's what pumps through the heart. That's what carries the nutrients in and takes the toxins away. John 4 and 14. You want to turn there, please? And it's Jesus speaking at the well, isn't it? We know this one. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the pure water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of spring water, up unto everlasting life. So we know that story there that he, you know, he, Christ was talking of the, the spiritual life we have by taking that water. So the, the water could be equated to the spirit there. To have a healthy spiritual heart, we must live and breathe that spiritual life. Okay, so physically we can go a little while without food, but we can go, you know, some time without food, a few days as a Christian without reading the Word of God and stuff, and there's probably most of us here have done that from time to time where we've, something's going on and we've had a few days where we haven't opened our Bible. But we really need that water, don't we? If, we? if we were to do something and sin against God and lose the Spirit, well, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to get that back, isn't it? Um, it can only come back through, through repentance and, and prayer. Um, if we're not living the spiritual life that we're called to live according to the Bible day by day, we won't survive spiritually. We will backslide. So we need the food, we need the water, which is the spiritual life. And if we're not living that spiritual life in our walk as Christians, we're going to backslide. You know, it's, it's, it's going to go downhill, isn't it? The other thing that's good for the physical heart is exercise, isn't it? We all know that, that some exercise is good. And the beauty of this, um, when you preach a message, you can... Preach to yourself, and that's exactly what I'm doing here tonight. So if anyone else gets a benefit from it, good luck. But this is uh, stuff that I wanted to study for me, and I know it's good for me. Um, the book of James, 2 and 26. You don't have to go there if you don't want. For as, the body, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So I, I equate the exercise to, to, to faith and the works as a Christian. It says there quite clearly, faith without works is dead also. How can we say we have faith if we're not doing any works for God? Pretty simple stuff in it. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty plain. That's just the way I want to keep it. Um, what plans have you for God's kingdom? That's the question I'm asking. This is part of your heart check tonight. That's um, asking you what plans that you have for God's kingdom. Uh, what works by faith are you working towards in God's kingdom? I'm asking myself that question. What, what am I doing by faith? What am I working towards in God's kingdom? And I, I've, I've come to realise that if you don't have a plan to succeed, that's as good as a plan to fail. Okay, minimal stress. The other thing I mentioned, which is good for a healthy physical heart. And it's something we all need to be reminded of, and, and I'm reminding myself here tonight as well, 1 Peter 5 or 7, we just might quickly turn there, please. 
I actually go to, go to Matthew 11 and 28. I think that's a scripture already mentioned today. But we know 1 Peter 5 and 7 is casting all your care upon him for he care for you. And that's something we just don't do enough of, of as Christians, is it? So many times we take distress and cares and things that happen in this world and, we, and when they're all over a few days later we might pray for them but sometimes then it's too late, isn't it? So in Matthew 11 and 28, it says, Come in unto me, and we know all these scriptures, all, all ye that are labour and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. This one come up this morning, didn't it? You use these ones this morning, brother? Yeah. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And verse 30 says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So, we got to deal with stress to keep our spiritual heart healthy and to keep our physical heart healthy. And we all have stress. We all have different things. What's stress for me is something different for brother or something different for sister. There's no doubt about that. But we all have stress. We all have things we worry about. But I, I don't think, I know that I don't cast my burdens upon the Lord enough. And that I don't turn to prayer enough when times when I've got something which is upsetting me. And we know that stress and constant stress, um, and some of us live under constant stress. We, we really do. Um, it's a killer to both physically and spiritually. Um, we know that if we're under that stress all the time, we need to break from it. And sometimes there's no break from it for different reasons. It could be, you know... Um, Children is, is one, obviously, and, and, and then peop, if you're in pain or if, you're, if you've got a, you know, you're married to a, to a non-Christian partner or, or you've got financial worries, you know, um, sometimes some of us are under cons consistent stress and what's stress for one person might be different for another. But um, we, we really got to not forget to cast our burdens upon the Lord. We need to take these scriptures to heart, don't we? Because this is what it's about, the heart, isn't it? and find that rest in our souls and cast our burdens upon the Lord. Because living with that constant stress is going to damage you physically and it's going to damage you spiritually. So we need to remember this, you know, when you're thinking about our silly little heart check we had, just remember one way we deal with stress is to cast our burdens upon the Lord. And we need to spend more time talking about that and praying about that and getting that into our brain, into our mind, into our heart. <laughs> it's all this confusing stuff. Um, and another thing which is, is really stressful is, and I'm learning a little bit about this lately, is by thinking negatively about every situation, especially things that happened in our past. We, we've all had a lot of things happen in our past, I know I have, and everyone here has. You know? There's not one of us here that haven't had things that happened and by being negative about these things and always thinking about them, you know, how, how can you get there and say, well, I had this stressful thing in my past, but I've, I'm a Christian, I've cast all my burdens upon the Lord. But then a year later or six months later or two years or five years later, you're still saying to people, oh, this is really bad. You know, this, 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 I love this girl and she left me. It's really bad and I just can't get over it. You know, or I, I, you know, I, I lost $1,000 when I sold that car or I, whatever. You know, we all have different things going on, don't we? You know, but to really, um, to, to look back all the time is really bad and we know what happened to lots well, if we look back. It's really important to look on the positive side of life because that's going to get rid of a lot of stress. And I know physically that when people are upset and under stress, their pain level goes through the roof. Okay? When people calm down, their pain level goes down. Um, you know, when you get someone upset about something, and we go to this thing called psychogenic hyperventilation all the time where someone's had a fight with their mum, and, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and, they, you know, and they hyperventilate. Well, their pain is so much, you go to take their blood pressure, oh, what are you doing? You know, because they're so stressed that pain is through the roof. It's just amazing how the, the, the physical, the emotional side of what's happening to them manifests itself physically. You know, and, and, and we know it does other things. It's, it's bad for our heart and it's bad for other parts of our body. You know? I know, um, you know, 
poor sister up the back here, you know, a bit stressed out and got mouth ulcers, didn't she? This is how stress manifests itself, you know, physically in our bodies. It's really, um, it's really an amazing thing how, how what, what's happening to us physically and, and spiritually manifests itself in that way. You know, I'm not saying that um, it's, it's sin is causing bad health or anything like that. I'm just saying that constant stress on your body, it manifests, it's bad for your heart, it's bad for you. Yeah, your immune system goes through the floor and, and you start, start to get infections and things. You know, so we really uh, got to exercise that cast your burdens upon the Lord. Um, so, usually at the start of the year, most people have a New Year's resolution, don't they? And they always say, this year I'm going to do this, this and that. And, and how many of us have ever had New Year's resolutions but really failed to see them through? Yeah, I'm one, two, three, four, probably about 30 years of that, yeah. <laughs> be, be honest with you. Um, and, and, you know, are, are we kicking the goals in our life that we plan to kick for, you know, for ourselves and for God? We know that if we get this done for ourselves and that'll help us be better for God, won't it, you know? And we have all these ideas in our head and, and then at the end of the year we go, ah, oh, didn't really happen this year, too busy, didn't get there, didn't lose that 30 kilos, didn't, didn't save that money up, didn't put that $150 away a week so I can go to Africa. Oh. Did for the first few weeks, done great, then lost it, didn't I? You know, or... You know, really had to save up for a new car, or yeah, you know, we all got different ideas and goals, haven't we? You know, from it could be from a from a car to going to Africa, it could be for this or that, but then it just shh, as the year goes, and another year, thirty kilos overweight, another year you're broke, another year you haven't kicked that goal that you was going to kick this year. We've all, you know, most of us have been there. I know I've been there every year. Um, but remember what I said earlier, having no plan is a plan to fail. So who, who actually takes the time to, to really seriously work out a plan and live and breathe that plan? And you know what? There's a lot of successful people in the world, both Christian and non-Christian, who do that. And it actually works. And I've, I'm learning that lesson now in my life that that's what I should do. And so I am working on that and working towards that and learning the importance of that. The Word of God tells us to plan our way and the Lord and allow the Lord to direct our steps. If we can go to a proverb 16. This is all part of our heart check. all part of our heart check because in Proverbs 16 and verse 9 it says a man's heart devises his way but the Lord directeth his steps. Okay? So we as Christians work out a way this year that we're going to do whatever we're going to do this year and the Lord will then direct your steps on how to do that. See we know Pastor Gills had a plan to preach the gospel and to preach against false religion in Africa, don't we? And do you think that at the start of each year, Brother Gill gets there and goes, hmm, I might go to Africa this year, hmm, but then doesn't make any plans? Do you think he, he gets there by just sitting there and going, yeah, I'm going to go, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to. talking about my father, I'm going to see him soon. He, in his life, was a, had a drinking and alcohol problem. He was always going to do something. He'd never actually done anything. Yeah, but he, he's, he's nicknamed by all his mates and friends and people in the family was gonna because he was always gonna do something but never did but the, the point being here um, you know each time Brother Gil gets back from I remember when I went to Africa with him as soon as he got back we weren't even back we were, we were flying home and he was starting to plan his next trip he, before he got back in Australia he was thinking yep I'm going to go back then so he, 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 he's a man who's being successful at what he does because he plans. You, you understand what I'm saying, what I'm getting at? A plan is really important. But it's more than just a little thought you have in your mind that you lose in a week or two's time. Because every little plan I've had in my mind over the years, I've lost it a week or two later. Or every time I've heard a good message in this place, 
And then I know a week or two later and hardly remember that message and I lose it and I don't actually follow through with what that person that message said I should do and I agreed I should do it, but then I didn't. So um, does Brother Gill meticulously write down his plan, including his dates, accommodation and transport? And then he starts to work out his messages that he's going to preach over there. He's going to work out what's the, what they need to hear over there and start to plan the messages. He has them all prepared before he goes and we have a time, timetable of how he spent each day. Remember when I went with him, he sent me three or four updates to his timetable a, a month or two before we went. He had the timetable down. This is a three days of preaching, then we'll have a free day while we travel to this spot, then we'll have another three days of preaching, free day while we go to this spot, this spot, and then we'll have a couple of free days and we we'll, might take it easy and, and go to a national park and then we'll do that. And, then, and he has it all planned. And he has it all wrote down, doesn't he? And I think there's a lesson there for us all to learn. Um, what plans do you have? And I'm asking myself this question. Where am I going? What am I intending to do for the Lord? And there are probably lots of things in your head. There's always lots of things in my head. I know that. I have an overactive mind, brain at times. And, uh, and it, sometimes it all ends in confusion because there's not good planning there sometimes. Um, so we need to devise our way and let the Lord direct our steps. So let's think tonight about what we can write down and things we can achieve before the end of this year. We, we need to think about this. We need to think of some simple... It doesn't have to be a ten, 10 pages. It can be some simple things. Think about what you want to achieve this year. For, and it's going to be different for all of us. Like I said before, some of us might want to save some money for it for a trip to Africa, some of us just, just might want to change our job. And we know that that'll give us more time to spend on things working for the Lord. Some of us um, have all different goals and plans, but unfortunately, what is a great idea just falls into, because we get caught up, don't we, in different things. Let's, let's all think about writing some stuff down. Um, you know, some people want to spend more time studying a certain thing in the Bible or, you know... Um, we, we might want to do things in our physical life that we know are going to help us in our spiritual life to do work for God. All this is aimed at, it doesn't matter if you're doing something in your physical life, it may be trying to... See, one of my goals is I want to get out of working weekends. But to put that in place, I have to put some financial things in place and I've got to put some work things in place and try and get that Monday to Friday job so then I can always be in church on weekends. So that's a physical desire of my heart that I know I've got to put some things in place. But this is not going to happen just by me thinking once every couple of months, oh, that's right, yeah, I've got to try and work this out and do this and get that Monday to Friday job and all that. It, it's not going to happen just by me having the odd little thought and the odd little 10-second prayer then forgetting about it for another couple of months and then go, oh, I really hated working that block of shifts across that weekend and didn't get to church and I'm going to do something about that. And then This has been going on for years. And, and we've all got different things, haven't we? You know, what, what's important to me, it might be something different, you know, for Sandra or whatever, or, you know, you know, someone might want to take a trip to see some relatives that they really want to preach the Word of God to, or it can be a diverse amount of things. Like I said, it could be whatever. So, um, our, our spiritual heart needs exercise, and I said before, faith without works is dead. We need to write down a plan, um, and I've written down some plans. I, I've decided to put some of this stuff into action this year and, and realise that um, that I need to write some stuff down. So I, I've written down, you know, some, some of my goals um, and I'll, I'll put them on, you know, my notes here and I'll read them all the time. And I've put down some of my other goals here and I have these hanging up in, in my computer room and this is some, some, um, some other stuff that I do. You know, we can write some stuff down like this in some big bold letters and say, these are the things I'm going to do. I've got these five or six point plan and I'm going to get through this and I'm going to do this this year. But when you write it down and you put it somewhere visual and you make it visual like that, nice and colourful, right? Um, and you put it somewhere where you're going to see it all the time. Whether you write something like this down and you have it beside your bed and when you have your Bible reading time, you just read, yep, I'm going to do this, and this, 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 this. Because I've, I've, I've learned to understand through, through understanding the brain and rote learning over again that when you go over something over again, that's when you get it into your, into your mind and into your heart. And that's when you'll be more willing to act upon it. 
Does this make sense what I'm saying? Does it, you understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be too spooky here or hokey pokey, but I'm just saying that you know, we learnt our times tables you know, off by heart, didn't we? Because we and, it, and the Bible tells us clearly to meditate on the Word of God. And to and to and we, we know that by, by getting and we know that when when uh, you know our, our our good preachers preach they go over revision and they say the same things over to us and, and let's go back over what we learnt last week and we know because they know that by putting it in a couple of times it gets it in our head so it's a really good idea to have, have you know have some have some thoughts from God of things you want to do and achieve you know they could be both physical and spiritual goals and write them down. Write them down and put them on a nice thing and print them out. And put them on your mirror. So, okay, when you're making yourself beautiful every day before work, as a lot of people do, oh, yeah, I better quickly read this. I'm going to read this, 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 this. Or beside your computer where you sit, when you're on your Facebook, and what some people do, or what, whatever they do, or wherever, or beside your bed, you know. Put it there and just read it over again. And you'll find that by doing that, you, you, you'll achieve your goals far better, rather than just forget about him and going, yeah, that was really, that's really good what I heard last week at church, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I do that in the next few months, and then what happens? We don't do it, do we? We've all been there. I know I've been there many times. Um, so, you know, I had a few thoughts. I thought, rather than lying, lying in bed at night thinking, you know, did he or she really say that? that you heard from someone else, you know. Oh, you know, um, brother such and such said that, sister such and such said that, you know, I'm a whatever, whatever. You know, uh, th- these silly little things we think about, don't we? You know, and we go, oh, well, I wonder why they said that. But did they really say that? Or did brother or sister have a different spin on it? You know, and then when, when it went to that set of ears and the next set of ears, it came out a different way and it, and it might, have, might, have, might have hurt hurt our hearts. Okay, this is what happens, but... We just got to not care about that stuff because it's really, it's really silly business, isn't it? I'd say that you should read your positive action plan over and over again until you get it into your heart, into your soul and mind. It, you know, and this may not be for everybody. This just may be, you know, if one, one or two people, people here tonight might think this is something worthwhile for them and, and, and they might do it, you know? Great, do it. Others, others might have their, their life together and they might be really motivated and they've got their, their goals and their plans and it's all coming together and that, that's great. But um, I know that I, I, I need something like that to get into my head to keep reminding me. Um, in, my, in my job at work, I see what people put into their hearts. And I tell you, so much negativity goes into um, people's hearts. You know, I, went, I was telling you, I mentioned before about a, a way of, you know, having cardiac arrest is, is to uh, drink a cup of acid. And I went to this lady last week who drank a cup of what they call fluoric acid, which is worse than hydrochloric acid. And, um, and the other fellow with me, you know, he, he rang up poison information and said, oh, yes, that person has between one to six hours to live. And so, you know, we took her off the hospital and, and done what we could for her and, and, um, and took her to the Royal Brisbane so she could be seen by the best. But... You know, and we got a doctor to meet us en route too. We'd done everything we could for that lady, but we, we knew she was going to die. And, and, um, and we went back there that night because one of us left our car on scene. And her um, man was there. She was a 31-year-old lady. And standing at the door, which I'd seen before because I'd been to this lady before, was her little four-year-old daughter. You know, she was just a beautiful little girl. And um, it was really sad. But... Um, you know, and, I, and I was thinking this week, what does that woman put into her heart? What, what does she put in there? And I found out from the man that she was a, an alcoholic, a, you know, a drug abuser and a, and a gambler, gambling addict. She had all three things going, going for her. And, um, and she had numerous suicide attempts. And, and this time she was successful. She couldn't uh, do it by just taking pills all the time because someone always rings us and we come along and, you know, and pour charcoal down their throats and... And they vomit it up and it gets all the poison out of them and all these things we do to save people. And, and then, but she was determined to kill herself, so she did. She was, had been putting really bad things into her heart. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, don't lay in bed and think about, oh, did brother or sister be mean to me or did someone say something wrong by me? Because that's just negative thoughts is going to lead to stress, is going to lead to bad physical and spiritual things that's going to happen. 
What I'm saying is have a positive action plan and spend time thinking about that rather than the silly little things that are just going to bring you stress. She, you know, she was poisoning both her physical and spiritual heart, wasn't she? With drugs, alcohol, gambling. Um, and, you know, some of us might think here, you know, oh, I, I don't have a drug and alcohol problem. I'm not a gambler, so, you know, I'm all right. But, you know, um, I ask you and I ask myself the same thing, okay? What resentment, you know, what resentment, you know, what um, unforgiveness, what negative thoughts or woe is me or, you know, worry about my lazy lack of motivation do I have in my heart at times? And these things are poison in our hearts, just like alcohol and all these things. So what I would say from the bottom of my heart is, is for those of you who need it, you know, get organised, get positive, get a plan and look to your future, okay? That's what we all need to do. And sometimes I think um, it's easy to pick on Sister Heidi because she's not here, but I know there's some parts of her life that she's a very good planner at and she, she does this stuff very well. I know she spent a lot of her school holidays writing some textbooks you know, the first few years of teaching and, and you can't do that stuff without planning, can you? She just didn't sit down at the start of holidays and on get up of a Monday morning on the first Monday holidays. Oh, I just might start typing away and a textbook might come out of this. No, she had to plan it. She had to write it down. She had to still live her timetable even though she was on holidays. She had to, she had to know what content she was going to put into these books, I'm sure. And she had to plan it. She had to have a written plan of how she was going to write this textbook. I'm sure she did. And I don't know nothing about writing textbooks. But I know these things just don't, don't come from someone thinking, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I might do that. No, it takes a lot of planning. And, um, and, you know, if, if you can get more organised in your, um, you know, in your physical life, um, you're going to be more organised in your spiritual life, aren't you? Um, well, I, I know that, you know, uh, this will be the first week I won't get my email of the summary of the message for a long time because good sister Heidi is so diligent and organised that every week she types it all out and when I'm at work, usually about 12.30, I know that's the time Heidi and Trevor walk through the door. Because I know that's the time she hits send on that button. And I get it at 12.15, 12.20, I'm at work, I'm driving along, beep, beep, beep. Pull out my phone, ah, new um, email. Hi, here's today's message. And I start reading today's message by 12.30 when I'm at work. And I know that's helped me spiritually. And, and that's just, you know, an example of how someone who's being organised and, 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 and have that plan and know what they're doing, is, is, it's, it's a blessing to people. That's a positive thing. You know, some other examples, can a builder build a house without a set of written plans? Of course they can't. You know, even, even, even back 2,000 years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they had a written plan out before they built their structures. I mean, who can just start throwing the blocks on the ground and hope that a, a, a big temple's going to be built? No, they had to have it planned out. I'm sure they planned the pyramids out because, you know, they're pretty amazing. Do... And, and do, do you think that Pastor Gill's trips to Africa would be so successful unless he didn't have a, you know, a proper plan including all the details? Do, do you think that he just suddenly sits in his office when he's bored one day and he's twilling his phone? I might go to Africa next week. Ring up. Oh, yeah, make a booking. Gee, I, I really hope that I can find some accommodation when I get there. Oh, I need a car too. Oh. Yeah, no, I'll find something when I get there. Oh, uh, yeah, I can write a few messages on the plane on the way over to preach while I'm there. Do you, do you think that's how he operates? So I tell you now, I know better, he doesn't operate like that. He's thought about his trip six months before he goes. He's thought about what he's going to preach. He's thought about where he's going to stay. He's thought about every day what he's going to do each day, almost down to the hour by hour, where he's going and what he's doing. And then a week or two later, he, he changes that. And there's nothing wrong if you, if you write yourself a bit of a, some sort of positive action plan to get yourself motivated that these, this is on computer and I've changed this a lot of times. And I go in and <laughs> don't like that bit, delete, <laughs> tape type in this bit, add to this, print, done. You can change it and he changes his plans but he has a plan. If we don't plan to succeed by having no plan by default, we're going to plan to fail, in my opinion. So, I'm, nearly, I'm turning 50 this year and I'm just learning about some of this stuff. It's really interesting. You know, it's, 
you know, and, and if some of you younger people can get your head around some of this stuff now, you're going to be far more successful in, in your spiritual life working for God than what you are. If you just think year in, year out, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to have good intentions, but if nothing happens, nothing happens. Pray to God that he will give you something to do and get a plan and work on it. And if that plan looks like it's not going that way, we'll de delete that paragraph, put a new one in and start going towards that. And read it every day. Read it every day. And you will be amazed when you put something into your, into your mind by reading it and putting it into your heart. But what's going to happen to you is all of a sudden your actions will move towards achieving them goals and plans because it's just not something you thought about a month ago and then you hope it's going to be recalled to your memory in three months' time when some opportunity comes up. No, you're reading it every day and you have put it into your mind so that you're going to jump on that opportunity when it's there. Yeah? So if that's good for you and that'll work for one person here, I'd be happy. So just in uh, closing, I just want to say get motivated. You know, get that spiritual life that God wants you to have and get a plan. Okay? Any questions? Does anyone want to add to that? Does anyone think it's other rubbish? I like a debate. <laughs> I'm happy to debate. Did anyone hear anything really strange when they put this thing on their heart? Was it going kaboom, kaboom? Oh, the people in the fast row's hearts always beat faster than the ones back. I know that. See, look, Paul's laying back. He's got a heart rate of about 60. Caps here going boom, 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 boom. What's he going to say next? He's going to put me on the commission. Yeah. <laughs>